like I say, it's great to be back in Newport. Um, uh, Newport's always been uh, the roots uh, of my uh, adventure in fishing, which is my life. Uh, I've pretty much dedicated, you know, uh, I'd say just about uh, every day of my life to fishing. Uh, some people get excited about music, uh, and that's their passion. Uh, they get up on stage and play this song. Uh, for me, uh, it, it's uh, music is my fishing or vice versa. And Newport is where that all started, uh, right actually on this site where this building was built. Um, used to walk around on the docks right down here in Barcadero and catch perch, uh, you know, from the bank right here. I graduated from uh, Oregon State University's uh, green uh, program just across the bay and I got my first job here uh, working for one of the charter boat companies. Uh, this, this, uh, right over here, Lady Jane, it was a Newport sport fishing. So for me, this is a, a really uh, amazing opportunity to come up in front of you guys and, and a, another uh, a point in my life that uh, I, I'm glad to share with you guys today. And I get to talk about how I'm fishing. So uh, with that said, we can, you know, kind of move into the, the presentation of how the biology uh, I wanted to cover a little bit of that about that because you know if we're going to go after halibut, you should understand a little bit about your uh, the quarry. Uh, Oregon in their new season for 2022, we're going to have some amazing opportunities this year that we fought uh, hard for, and I've advocated uh, for as well for the the past three seasons. Um, you know, finding that trophy halibut. You know, what are some strategies to look for that? How to make it happen? Uh, and then uh, what I, I definitely have, have a lot of experience um, and it's been a steep learning curve, uh, a long journey with Minn Kota and uh, you know how to use that motor, how to maintain that motor, how to make sure that it doesn't destroy your vessel uh, you know in the process of using the motor there's uh, so much uh, that goes into um, just owning one. A powerful tool. Uh, so anchoring uh, and uh, you know baits and shredder bars, electric reels, those are just a, a couple of the things that I want to try and get to. So halibut biology, uh, I know they're they're a really interesting fish in that uh, they start out uh, as, a, as a floating uh, egg out in the water column. The halibut they spawn offshore uh, in the winter time, very deep. Uh, in, they don't. They may try and do it off the coast of Oregon. However, it's it's not known that they're successful. The halibut that we uh, get to see in our fishery here actually originate in Alaska, uh, in the Gulf of Alaska, British Columbia, and the Bering Sea uh, areas. That's where their uh, the population originates. Uh, a lot of our fish uh, they travel back and forth over these great distances. Halibut are very strong swimmers big powerful bodies and tails and when they lay their eggs up there they start up you know they're floating in the water column they hatch after a couple weeks during the winter the water the ocean's currents during the winter usually are, are, are flushing towards land and those halibut will settle out be uh, juveniles um, and they'll grow uh, as young halibut for a couple of years right there uh, in those um, uh, around the Gulf of Alaska, British Columbia, Bering Sea. When I worked up there in the in the uh, trawl fishery as an observer, we'd see these juvenile halibuts come up as bycatch, unfortunately, in a lot of their cod fisheries. And it's still an ongoing um, problem that we need to address as, as sports fishermen and even as commercial fishermen uh, to try and uh, minimize the amount of halibut that's uh, caught as bycatch and wasted in that fishery because it's, it's fish that we're all not getting to, to utilize. So they grow up, they get, they get into that age class, of, you know, like two, three years old, they start their migration down uh, south here and they'll end up uh, off the coast of California, off the coast of Oregon, they settle out, they, they start growing. We see them, uh, you know, in the, a hundred fathoms, six hundred feet, on out to a thousand feet, kind of their 
their uh, preferred habitat as the summer comes along and uh, maybe food is in the intro. They're really, uh, they're really reactive to food sources. Uh, so, uh, and these are maybe even traditional or cyclic type food source availabilities. Molting crab, dungeness crab being one of them. Uh, a lot of these processes have happened for thousands of years, so these fish have adapted their life cycles to match them. So in the springtime when our crabs start molting, we see some of the larger halibut uh, move into that near shore, uh, you know, feast on those. Uh, the larger halibut also will we'll start to see them migrate to the near shore to, to take advantage of the uh, rockfish that are found there, as well as our herring spawn, the squid. Uh, where I see the uh, smaller chicken size, it seems like they depend a lot on living in, the, in that deeper water offshore. So this is a, a, a real um, common slide that you, you know I always find myself referring back to uh, is the is what, what you're seeing is length on the x-axis and you're seeing a percentage of landings on the y-axis. It's a good explanation. It, it kind of shows um, it's the population of halibut. So don't a very what a normal distribution curve a science, science guy would tell you, but when you're looking um, at the peak of what we see for landings in the sport fishery, it's most of our fish are in the 30 to 36 inch range, uh, and those halibut are going to be in the six, six or seven year class, maybe even a little bit younger, five years, when they first become available to our fishermen. It's interesting to, to, to note this as you go along in your halibut fishing career and you fish every year because you'll see uh, one of the things we know about populations is that certain years are more productive for a year class, so we have these stronger year classes. Uh, two years ago I saw um, a new year class move into our fishery uh, down south, so I would say that it's our fishery in, in, uh, off of Oregon, California. We saw these abundance of 28 to 30 inch fish and now we'll be able to watch those fish grow uh, this year we should see a lot of the 36 to 38 inch fish that came from that strong year class what we also notice about this is that near the ends or the tails of the population is where these trophy halibut exist these and to me a trophy halibut uh, is anywhere around that 50 pound mark 50 inch mark um, they are a different fish, uh, and they behave a lot differently than we see the younger uh, schooling fish. While the, the large halibut do school, um, I see their behavior uh, being that they, they, they definitely would like to be in certain areas. Maybe it's the best habitat that's available. Um, the only thing I can call what, what I've observed is, is they have roosts these large uh, fish that you want to target, these uh, 70 to 100 pound range. And uh, again, that's the, the tail end of a year class that survived, and for whatever reason, they survived. And we know that fish like to be uh, with other fish like size, so we see these fish accumulate, and maybe it's uh, that they're getting ready to migrate back to Alaska where they're gonna spawn together. Uh, it could be the food availability in that habitat. But what I do see, and what you should be looking for as anglers, is when you catch these large halibut, obviously you're gonna mark that on your GPS, you're gonna return back there. If you see that you're catching large halibut consistently in that place, you have found one of these roosts. I have only seen uh, or known of possibly two in my time uh, of, of fishing for halibut, and, that, and it's a very rare find. So. If you, if you see that, definitely realize what you're seeing. A lot of the times that's around a ledge or a hard spot, an old river channel that's actually there. Uh, but these are our, our, our halibut. At the end of this are the trophy ones. So in Oregon, we're gonna get a really liberal long season this year, which is gonna be to the advantage of all of us that have time to, to fish. We're not so dependent on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're gonna be able to fish uh, multiple days, every seven days a week, hopefully. Uh, and uh, that's gonna start up here May 12th 
and go through June 30th. The season is yet to be finally approved, but this is the ODFW um, suggested season, so I don't see any reason why it's not going to be approved by the PFMC uh, or the IPHC. There's been a lot of halibut that's left that's been, we see this, so what's interesting to me finally is that for what we've advocated for is that we want to be able to, to utilize the amount of halibut quota that's been allocated to us as sports fishermen in area 2A. Uh, the last three years, uh, four years in a row, uh, over half of that, 50% of that quota that we were allocated as sports fishermen has been left on the table at the end of the season. That is unacceptable and this shouldn't be happening. Why was it happening? Because of caution uh, in the fishery that, you know, um, I, I think that it, it took some time to get this changed, um, but now they're going to let us go, go at it and execute it in a manner that makes more sense to me. We can't, we, we don't know when the good weather is going to be, so let us fish when the good weather happens. We don't have to go out on these bad days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We can go out on a Monday, and when the fish are caught, they're caught. And, uh, you know, it, it could bite us as sports fishermen in the butt because Newport here has one of the largest um, uh, charter fleets uh, along the coast. They, they account for over 60% of the landings come right out of this port. So we'll see how it gets, uh, how it shakes out in the end. You know, do the sports fishermen benefit from it? Is there a loss? It's, it's a little bit of a gamble, but my hope is this season we're, we're finally going to get what we've asked for and that's to catch our fish. Get the chance to catch our fish. Oregon's record halibut. Always, what, what are the big ones? This is a question I get all the time when I'm on my charter boat. What are the biggest halibut that we know about that have been recorded in Oregon? Obviously, there's probably been other fish caught. A lot of anglers don't seek that status. Um, they're not looking for the record, but this is where it's at. Um, Central, Central Coast. I would bet that that fish came from Vesita Banks or in that area, uh, in that type of rocky habitat. 171 pounds. Um, the largest one I've ever caught was 115 pounds, and it was right out here on the Stonewall Banks on the uh, east side of it. Just out outside, if you get out there and fish, you know that there's a lot of current there. Um, and that's where my biggest one came from. We, we get to see every year a lot of fish in the 50 pound, 40 pound range. We find, we, a few years ago we found those uh, roosts that had these 70 pounders. We probably took upwards of 50 fish in the 70 pound range from one location in, in a matter of a few years. But they're there. I was able to find some stuff last night online about you know, that I could show you a visual, visual, visual uh, some of these places that you might find these trophy halibut. And, they, and definitely this would be where I would, I would be looking for as a fisherman out of Newport. The north end of the, the rock pile, the, the uh, inside of the north end, there's a famous little spot there, at least it was when I fished out of here, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. We saw a lot of large fish came off of the inside of the rock pile. We drift that edge. Um, obviously, there's a, a, a conservation zone now around it that uh, you definitely want to be aware of and fish around it. You get the chicken ranch. It got its name from the you know, chicken. There's still some big fish that come out of there, though. The banana banks, the guys were talking about the long leader. There must be some hard bottom up there. That's why those, those uh, yellow tails and uh, uh, canaries are getting caught up there. They, they really do live in these deserts, but uh, any structure out there is going to create rip lines and currents, and that's where you're going to see those fish congregate, just like you're going to see the halibut. Casita Banks, you've got the north and the south bank. Uh, there's the pig. It's all... I, I've been up there a few times. It's a long run from me from Coos Bay and I'm really careful about when I do it, but I do do it a couple times a year because I really feel that that's where I'm going to find that fish of a lifetime uh, for my clients. We've, every time we've been there, we've never been disappointed by the size of the fish that we catch there. Um, I personally have fished um, on, the, on the south bank 
uh, because it's the closest, it's a little place. Um, oh, 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 but I'm really good. <laughs> they call it uh, Wayne's, Wayne's World. Uh, there's an Ahe, I found the pointer. So down in this area, there's, it's a pretty popular place to fish. Um, I've caught fish out in, the, in between these two uh, areas of the bank. I've been up on the uh, north end of the bank in, into these high spots up in here. Um, all this has fish. It seemed like wherever I put a line down and we drifted a little ways, we eventually caught a halibut. Um, it just, it makes sense. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing place to fish. That, that on the stonewall banks, uh, this gravel, I would say, is what this is, a central fish habitat, solid rock substrate. I know that this is a good area right here I used to fish, and we'd catch fish all the way down through this, and usually large fish. I don't know if it's like that now, but I, that's where I would go if I was headed out of Newport, if I couldn't make it to the sea. Okay, so I like this. I wanted to give you guys like a, just a little this saying, nothing makes a fish bigger than almost being caught. So big halibut are always going to test your gear. So it's just like steelhead fishing. It's a mantra that I live by. Every time I tie a knot, every hook that I put down there, uh, all my swivels uh, from my line, it is all to catch the big, big one because eventually you're going to have that that encounter with that large halibut. It's gonna happen if you get out there enough and fish. So when you do it, you know, go into it with that attitude. Build everything stronger, bigger, uh, and ready for that fish. You know, um, because they will show up and they're gonna they're gonna catch you off guard and there is nothing that is worse than, than losing that big one. Some of the things that I take with me that I to, to make sure that I'm ready for our fish to get up in the 100 pound class. Definitely a harpoon. Uh, that's one of the best things about halibut fishing, I think, is getting to stab one with a harpoon. There's something primal and uh, awesome about it. I attach my harpoon. England sells some really good WPS um, uh, aluminum harpoons, super good quality. Heavy. You're going to want a harpoon that can drive that down through them. Where do you harpoon them? Uh, I, I go, uh, my good friend Nick Pappas, uh, he convinced me that the best place to, to harpoon a big halibut is right in the, in the gut sack because that's going to be where it's going to have some give, you're going to be able to penetrate, um, but mostly it's that stretch. Um, if When I go into the meat sometimes, uh, you know, or I, I'll strike the uh, backbone and make a bad shot, I don't get full penetration. But I will when I get that gut sack. It's gonna go right through it, and, it's, and I usually look right for where the pectoral fin comes out, and that's where I'm uh, aiming. Uh, obviously, you're gonna to wanna to have a big gaff to control that fish. And then I say I attach my harpoon dart to a uh, poly ball, it can go overboard, it's fine. The fish will bite on that poly ball. The, one of the first big howl that we hooked off of Stonewall, that one that was our biggest, I wasn't hooked to a poly ball. We were tied to the side of the boat. Uh, the fish uh, dove down after we fought it for like an hour. We didn't have electric reels in. We'd actually reeled it up on this giant pin senator uh, reel with some black braid. That I don't know what it looked like. Uh, some, it was really in the beginnings of of all that stuff and uh, anyways that fish ripped uh, the, uh, the dart all the way out through its body and we were luckily we got it back up and got to land it. But the poly ball is awesome to, to just take that shot, throw it overboard. You can go back and get the fish. Can you talk the difference about spear and halibut and, and spear and uh, uh, wicked tuna? Yeah. Uh, so, well, with the Wicked Tuna, they're throwing that dart. It's, it's real similar, though. Uh, the, the head. So for our, our, halipu, for our, our, our halibut darts uh, are like the one you can see in this picture. It's more of a cylindrical, long dart. Whereas the Wicked Tuna darts, uh, they look like an arrow on one end, and uh, they're incredibly sharp. Uh, they're sharpened. I bought one this year because I wanted to have one of, for some other fish that I'm going to go after. Um, 
like the big tunas. But that is, that's one of the main differences is the shape of that dart. The halibut dart we have is meant to go through the fish, turn sideways, and pull back up against it. Uh, any of the, the, halibut, the har harpoons that you would get, even the wicked tuna ones, would be a great, would be a great way to, to stick them. Yeah, I think I'm more of the people that think that they're going to stick it with a spear and, and leave it in them and need to pull the shaft back out of there and just leave oh. the yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a, you're just leaving the dart, you stab the tuna, or I mean the uh, halibut, it goes through the halibut, you pull back, you got the shaft in your hand, put it back on the boat, the uh, line is connected to your dart, and the fish can then struggle on the, on the line of the poly ball and the dart. Um, swivels. Uh, swivels I find is, is one of the weak links. Uh, I see it in some of the spreader bars that we can buy. Uh, I see it in some of the um, the cheaper stuff that we can get that will work for, for like long leader or for bottom fish. Uh, for the halibut and the bigger game fish, I like, uh, my favorite is these, these um, ones that have the cork screw like we would use for, um, for tuna, let's say, or, or any big fish because I, I twist that on, it's not going to come undone uh, no matter how far hard that fish is struggling. Uh, it, and it makes for quick leader changes. Um, go for the big stuff. Use use the good swivels. Um, hooks. My favorite halibut hook is a gamagatsu. Uh, they make the sharpest hooks that I've ever uh, been able to find. And I haven't had them fail on fish over 100 pounds. Uh, in the 70, 80, you know, I use a double hook rig. I tie it myself. Uh, with, I, I tie the leader on 175 pound gin tie. You can get it right here in England. This is where I get all my stuff. Uh, the gin tie line, 175 pound, a couple uh, these nine uh, octopus hooks on a, a leader, you know, two feet long. Use a double hook rig. It's a lot like it would be just like a salmon rooching rig. You tie it up the same way. You can use, I use crimps a lot of the time instead of uh, my, for my finishing knot when I'm going to attach it to my leader. I'll use a crimp and create a loop at the end of my leader and that's what I can put on this corkscrew. It makes it really quick on and off for bait changes. But Gamagatsu again makes a great hook. Octopus, you probably have to order it from uh, the guys here. They probably, they may carry some other hooks that, uh, that are like that, but uh, definitely, I really like those. Um, I have a lot of confidence in them. So, uh, getting to the uh, Minkota, the Minkota electric motor, and uh, Garmin actually has got one. Uh, I was hoping that uh, that when I, I did some research that the uh, Garmin was going to be uh, a little bit longer. It's, it's, they're, they're still working on it, though. So Minn Kota's, they, the ones that we're interested in are going to be anywhere from 60 inches up to the largest that they make is an 87 inch. I, I, I've used, uh, I started using them when they first came out. I wanted to hover. I wanted to come into anchor. I was, you know, uh, and, and the motors would do that. I bought their uh, Altera was the first one and it's self-deployed. And I, I, I've had multiple Alteras and it got to, to be uh, where I was um, always setting them in for repair. That self-deploy feature, while it's really awesome, it, it seems to cause a lot of problems with them, uh, that they still haven't mastered. So now I've switched to one that's called the Tarova, and I, and I deploy it manually. I took that part of the equation out that would seem to keep, keep failing them for me, uh, and now I get uh, at least a year of heavy use. Uh, I fish over 150 days a year on the ocean. So it's really getting used and I can get it through a year. Whereas before I was getting about every three months I was having to uh, swap them out. Uh, this is my new uh, uh, Raider boat. This is a 32 foot, uh, it's their 290C Raider. Uh, this is just the power of this motor. This is an 87 inch. Um, Tarova. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an anchor at this moment uh, in this uh, photo. We're, we're actually long leader fishing. A lot of my, instead of drifting, uh, I, I actually anchor on uh, those fish and I fish vertically for them. Um, I still, 
The neat thing about the Minn Kotas is uh, you can anchor and it'll hold your boat in place in, in relatively average conditions on the ocean. Uh, it can also, you can set it up to where it will drift you in a, with your bow into the current. You'll actually be able to slip backwards and you'll be taking that, those waves and it just makes it more comfortable on the boat. But the, the, this, this is an 11,000 pound boat that this motor is holding back. It's absolutely amazing. I, I uh, have a video here. I'm not sure how difficult it'll be to play. Um, here I wanted to show uh, us, us actually um, using the Minkota. So let me step down here for a second and I'll see if I can turn it on. It'll show, what it shows is us at anchor. Uh, and actually this is the technique that, that allowed us to get onto these, these halibut roosts. And this is the one where we're, we're actually fishing uh, on this roost and it's off of Coos Bay. And we're, we're all sitting, lined up here. So you can see we can sit relatively close together. It's a small spot. These, these large fish really wanted to be in this very special place and they would they would travel there. You can see the Minkota, now it's working. It's, it's, it's got us an anchor. We're using our electric reels. Uh, I'm a big fan of using these. Um, they they uh, allow you to hook that halibut up and bring it up. Uh, any fisherman, whether you're old, young, they can fish with this. Um, so we got a bite. The first thing we do is we use it, we pick this electric up and we turn it up full throttle and the drag's tighten. So it's driving those hooks in to that fish. And you can see the anglers has got a hold of it pretty good and uh, up we come. What's that? No, we're using 80 pound braid. It's a, I, I like the Power Pro, but now I use the Daiwa braid 8. Here's us with that dart. This isn't a really large halibut, but it was about in the 30 pound range. I'm, t I'm showing uh, how to dart this fish. I, I asked the client to slide the rod forward if the fish lays, and then I'm aiming for right behind that, that uh, pectoral fin in the gut sack. You get to see we've got a spreader bar, Works really well when you're at anchor fishing. Um, have no problem landing uh, or getting the fish with that. You can see my leader setup that I was talking about. Now this is why uh, one of the guys that fishes by me, he's gonna get one of the big ones that live there. He's got a, a 70 pound halibut right there, just harpoon. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, this. If you go and look at our videos online that we've done, I have a YouTube channel as well as uh, I have a lot of my content on uh, our Facebook at Sharky's Charter Fishing. But this is this is what we're uh, what we're doing there is anchored. We're anchored up, hovering on one of these roosts. We instead of drifting, which I, I did a lot of. Uh, when I fished out of Newport and, and halibut fishing prior, I would, when we anchor, we just like, you know, I, I got to thinking like it's like that stuff they do in Alaska. We're bringing the fish to us. We're to, we, we really like to use these um, uh, shad or herring or I, I use a lot of the Procure products. The, the, the crab and shrimp attractant is basically fish oil. And so I take my baits and I will soak my baits in that and then uh, and utilize that. Um, but what it really does is we lay out this scent trail and halibut really key in to those scents. And uh, uh, it's one of their chinks in their armor. They will come literally from, I don't know, uh, at least uh, 100, 100 yards initially. And the only reason I say that is because a lot of times we'll anchor up and 20 minutes later I pull the fish into the boat we'll have uh, a fish come in and, and bite us or when we just drop down nothing had happened. Um, the fish are definitely moving around a lot. They, while halibut are ambush predators, they sit on the bottom, 
they, they actually get up in the water column and move a tremendous amount. And they do it based on tides and, uh, and around the tides. My favorite time to fish is either is at the tide changes and around the tide changes. Uh, th that's when your current is actually slacking up. So as a, all the way from when they were juvenile fish to adults, uh, it's all about how to get the most amount of food for the least amount of work. And so for a halibut, that means that when that current is slacked up, they're able to, to, to maybe uh, get up and feed, even as a, as a, a larvae, it was time to, to feed them. And when in the current's running, it's time to hunker down and kind of sit there. So uh, I think that a lot of times when we're in the middle of these big tide changes, uh, the halibut kind of sit down and they let food come to them. And maybe you'll get them to move a little bit and come to you with that set, but Definitely make sure that if you can, you fish around those tides when you're uh, anchor fishing for halibut. Um, installation of this motor. This is what I really wanted to focus on. It's hard to get a Trova or Altera motor right now, uh, big for a myriad of reasons, but if, if you do get one and you want it, this is what people ask me the most about when they talk to me, is how to, how to install it. It's really important that when you, your initial it, uh, kind of discovery is to, to ask yourself how much room do I have because if, the more room you have the, the longer the shaft you can get the better the longer shaft is the way to go because it's it, it's not going to come out of the water there's no minus to having a long shaft uh, as there is if you had a shorter motor and you're in a choppy swell your motor can come out of the water so this is our 87 inch uh, uh, Trova now, you can see here, down in here, this is a really key place that you want to focus on when you install the Minn Kota. What I found um, was that you, you will want some sort of a base plate on top of your, your plate in the front. You can easily cut aluminum with a, a, a skill saw or you can have one of the shops cut it for you. But get yourself a base plate and if you can't weld it on because you've got paint, Take and bolt it on. I did that with my original one. It really adds some rigidity to the hole. What we found was that guys, as they were uh, doing this in the last five years or so, you know, coming and, and, and as the motors gained popularity, they bolt it right onto the deck. And because of the amount of force and flex that this motor is is in leverage, it is it is cracking their welds on their decks. And we don't want that. These are too, way too expensive boats. So but by I, I got lucky when I engineered her, we could say it was a good move, was that I put that base plate down. I never had that problem. Where I did find was, was here uh, in, my, in my removable um, pedestal here, this base. This is a, a Lee Lock design. Uh, you could buy, it's a two-piece base, uh, so I could ex extract the motor off of the boat and swap it out with an anchor. Uh, roller if I chose to. I never did that, but the Lee Lock system, they, it comes with two holes drilled here uh, and you would um, basically attach these two pieces together. If there's any movement that's going to be the chink, it's, you don't want to see any movement in your base uh, because over time that will crack and that will wear and you will break it. And uh, people have, these motors have fallen off of boats, they, like I said, they crack, they will crack aluminum. Uh, it, gets, it gets really bad. So focus on this. When, when Raider boats, when they ask, you know, I asked them to build this for me. They did a lot of customization on the boat. This is one of the things that I demanded that they do for me was weld this bottom piece to the frame and build it so it would take that. And, and it's, it's been amazing right now. Uh, another thing that you can see from up here is, is this uh, support arm. These are now standard issue when you buy the Tarovas, uh, they're going to give they're going to give this in a package to you when i first started they didn't have that you we were trying to figure out how to to keep this head from bouncing because of the uh the, the damage it might cause up in here uh, a little bit you can see there's a plug you're going to have to have a plug for the the bulkhead to, to, so you can get through that bulkhead the choice of that, you know, Minn Kota, again, Minn Kota stepped up to the plate. They, they created this plug uh, that you can attach your motor through uh, the through hole, and it, it's, it's great. It, I, I recommend it. 
Again, there's a, a close up of uh, the awesome welding that they do over there at Ranger in Colton. So batteries, uh, this is another question people always ask me about the installation process. What kind of batteries should I use? Um, I use uh, AGM, uh, or, uh, which is a, a glass mat battery. This is a battery that is, uh, you can put it in a compartment. If you're going to use a lead acid battery, you, you, you don't want to put it in a, underneath of a seat. That's a place where most of us store our batteries. For these Minn Kota's, it's either under the seats or in the seat boxes. But a lead acid battery has hydrogen gas escaping from the battery, and you don't want to have it in a closed space. By, by using an AGM battery, you're, they are not going, they're a sealed battery, they can actually, uh, they won't have that out, out gas in it. Now, uh, as lithium uh, technology uh, gets more affordable, um, my preference is going to be lithium for a lot of different reasons. Um, one is for weight. The, the lithium batteries weigh uh, less than half of what an AGM or a lead acid battery weighs. And weight's always a huge consideration when it comes to fuel prices. Where the more weight you put in that boat, the more energy it's going to take it to get up on a plane. And batteries weigh a lot. These batteries weigh upwards of 80 pounds in the AGM sizes that I'm using, 100 amp hour, uh, 120 amp hour batteries. Lithium's 40 pounds for a 200 amp hour lithium battery. Uh, England Marine sells uh, uh, some lithium batteries now uh, that are in that 100 amp hour rating. That's one of the things, the main considerations you want when you when you build your system is is that you need that those amp hours. That's what's going to keep you on the water fishing, going to keep you anchored. Uh, you're going to you're going to use that up in a day. So when you install it, I. In my Raider boat, I have this really neat in-floor. It kind of, wherever you're going to install it, that's going to lim limit your uh, battery size. Uh, battery size, go as big as you can afford, get as much battery as you can afford, and you won't regret having that, that extra power at the end of the day to, to allow you to hover in those tough conditions. And believe me, it's so much more fun to halibut fish when you're hovering and anchored than it is when you're having to drift and, and uh, you know, be as, as the captain, you can get out and actually fish. Uh, a lot of the stuff, you know, the, the electrical, you know, these guys here in England, they have got everything that you need. All the stuff that I use to install uh, my Nakotas, you know, uh, my rod holders, I come to these guys uh, because they've got the best. They. They have the, the knowledge and the experience. They've, they've sold all these things to multiple anglers. So I know that when I go down to England Marine and I ask them a question, they're going to tell me, um, you know, the answer. I don't have to question that. You know, you might go somewhere else and you question that. And, and uh, with these guys, I would say, you know, you're in good hands. Um, all these products you see, this is a switch. You want to have this. It's a, it's a breaker if you have a short. Obviously, you're going to want to put something on this. It's a tremendous amount of power that's coming out of these batteries. But I really like this this breaker switch. You get about a hundred bucks. It'll it allow me to, to turn the motor off. I had I had a motor uh, uh, short, and it actually started catching on fire on my bow. All I had to do was neutralize that energy source, and I was able to put it out. So, without being able to quickly neutralize that. You know, I don't know why it didn't trip it. It wasn't drawing enough amperage for the switch that I had. Uh, but it, I, I actually went over there, shut it off, no more smoke, no more fire. Uh, charging options, you got, my, my, I have had, I got two of these, uh, NOCO Genius. Uh, my lip, this, this charger is all waterproof. Um, Super easy, just plug it in at the end of the day, it's gonna charge those batteries. It's a 36 volt system, but this thing is smart enough to know that it's only charging 12 volt batteries, and it charges them individually. Uh, your, your remote. <laughs> this thing, uh, the remotes, is, is, uh, it's a necessary evil with our, with our uh, Minn Kota, but I am always looking for that thing. I'm always trying to keep track of it. It's as bad as a cell phone. Um, and as delicate as one too, unfortunately. But uh, what I can say is dielectric grease on the connections and keep it in a warm, dry place as much as you can.
that's about it. Uh, you know, come, you know, come a uh, friend me on Facebook at least to just see what's happening out on the ocean. Uh, I stay uh, up on the, the politics of it. Uh, you know, in our fisheries management, I put the feet, I put ODFW's feet to the fire when I get a chance for for us. Uh, you know, and uh, at the same time, I, I'm pretty willing to share information. Uh, I do like my space out on the ocean. I will say that, so don't, don't get right up on me. But uh, you can follow me, and I, I'm not going to have a problem with it. I just, uh, it's a big ocean, you guys. The golden rule, I would say, is if I could, one of the things I let leave you here with is to each other, treat each other, uh, you know, like you would like to be treated in, and uh, you'll, your lives will be much better. And that, that goes for out on the ocean, too. Yeah. You're going to talk about electric reels? Yeah, electric reels. Okay, I didn't get to that, so thank you. Uh, Daiwa Tanacom 750s. Uh, the workhorse uh, in my operation. Daiwa got it right. When they built the Tanacom 750, I bought them, they initially came out because I was, I just kind of threw shit against the wall and I was like, well, we'll see if it sticks. You know, we're gonna see how it's gonna turn out because these days everything breaks, you throw it away, you start over. And that's kind of what I thought was gonna happen with these Daiwa reels. That was exactly the opposite of what happened. These reels, uh, when they built them, they got them right the first time. However they did it, uh, I, you know, kudos to Daiwa. Amazing. Uh, Pin, Daiwa, Shimano, all quality products that I, I've had great luck with. Uh, but the Daiwa Tanacom 750, it'll hold enough 80 pound braid to get you out in uh, black hot depth, so uh, uh, 200 fathoms, uh, you know, you're talking 2,000 feet. Um, I spool mine up with 80 pound braid. Um, it works great. They, you know, there's, there's so many features on these reels that I don't even use. Basically, they've got a, <laughs> a brake and a throttle, and if you, you, you know, you can play with it and figure out some of the other things about them, but that's the main thing. So, dielectric grease, the cords, uh, Marinko plugins. Again, Marie, England Marine has got those plugins. There, you want to uh, set it up so it's like that. Uh, you know, you can rig it to your boat with a fuse off of a battery. You, you put them up underneath the rail so you don't lean against the plugins. Twist that in, and now you've got electricity. Uh, and these, these reels. We, we use them for our halibut, we use them for our long leader, I use them for fish and live bait, for lingcod, uh, anything where I'm using big heavy leads. I like a lot of weight. Why? Because it gives me control. I can fish vertically. I'm not scoping line out wondering where I'm at in the water column. I'm fishing under my boat. I don't have tangles as much. Um, you know, I'm able to fish six anglers. Uh, you know, as long as we work together and you, you know, you take the time to do that when you're using this heavy gear, um, it, will, it will allow you to do some things that you weren't able to do, like with the electric reels. Um, I'm, I'm able to do things that I, I couldn't do before. Have you tried their battery packs? I haven't used a battery pack just because I've got um, so many people that I, you know, uh, or if I'm setting them in the rail, that would be that would be a great thing to use if they you're work. mobile and and they work. That's, is it is it a, a bit, um, is it Daiwa battery pack? Yeah, the Daiwa battery pack is twist on six down about this one. Nice. It's about three inches around. See, there you go, you they guys. Run Do they sell them here in England? Uh, if they don't, they, they will. Get They'll get them for you. I I, I order mine from Daiwa. Oh, I had a question over here. Can these be adapted to plug into your Scotty electric downrigger plug in and yes, run off that's a the Marinko battery? Plug. That's that Marinko plug. It's a uh, basically a drill like a you get a tapered bit that's a uh, uh, you know you, you go up to an inch and a quarter or whatever. You just drill a small hole in your in your uh, aluminum and then take that tapered large bit and, and run it down to where it's going to fit that inch and. Uh, I think it's inch and a half or something, but it'll it'll give you a diagram on the Marinko plug, and then you just uh, will attach that to the aluminum, rig that right from your battery to a, a Blue Seas like fuse panel, um, and you can have I have six plugins on my boat. You can plug anything into that. I plug my Scotty um, pop puller into the same plugin that I use 
for my electric reel. Um, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to start fishing at night. Um, I've got lights that I can hang into the water uh, to attract game fish. Uh, I'm going to plug them into those. It just opens up a lot of things you can use. As if you want to use 12 volt, there's a plug-in for it now on your boat. Just make sure that you rig it with with the um, the fuse the fuse close to the battery because it is really a potential place to get um, a short, especially when you're dealing with the water. So, yes. So back to the yeah. Good question. Um, good question. Yeah, good, yeah, good question. Uh, the question was, when you set up your harpoon, um, how long of a lead do you want off of the dock uh, to your float or bungee cord? So uh, I don't, you know, I, I probably have it about six feet, maybe at the most. Not a long, uh, not a long. Uh, what I want to do is when I rig my harpoon, uh, I want to be able to uh, you know, you grab onto the dart, pull it tight as you, you slide your hand down, you've got that line tight, and now I've got a hold of the, the end of the harpoon with that line tight to my dart, and I've got the buoy. Usually what I have, uh, one of my clients do is I hand them the buoy, I say, hold this. If the fish tries to run, and throw it over. Just throw it over the side. If it doesn't, then I'm going to grab a hold of that and I take a wrap on it with my hand and gloves, and now I've got a way to move that fish around. But yeah, it, what I use, um, I use blue tuna cord uh, for mine. Um, you can use any type of line that you really want. I just have tuna cord because uh, I'm going to take, I'm usually going to take a wrap on it with my hands and I know that with that tuna cord it's not going to uh, cut me. Um, I always wear gloves too. A lot of the times I'm wearing gloves. Um, with that, how big of a poly ball are you using? Uh, I just use a small poly ball. It's, a basketball size. Um, you can use, one thing I've used uh, instead of like going and getting a, a poly ball, I just use the fender flip, the fenders that I have on the boat already that I'm using for docking. That way I'm not adding more stuff to my boat. But what I will do is I'll take both of those fenders and put them together uh, and use them both. Um, I have actually darted a big fish. When you dart them, obviously they just found out that they're in big trouble and they're gonna, they're gonna come alive. Um, and they will run. As soon as you stick them with the dart, most of the time if they, if they feel it or you just poke them maybe, they're gonna take a run. And uh, I've had them break the line. Uh, and, but, and so the, I do know that the, those, those floats, they will come back up. I've watched them, the 70 to 100 pound fish, they're gonna drag those floats under the water, and, but they will come back up with it. They, did, they, they got that initial dive, but for whatever reason, especially if you hit them in the guts, you're going to get them in their liver and they're going to bleed. And they're going to, it's kind of not, you know, they bleed out too. Uh, I would not try and harpoon one in the head uh, and stay away from the spine. It's just so hard to get it through. Um, I noticed you're using bait hooks. How come not circles? Is there a reason? Uh, you know, for me, I fish for halibut. Uh, since I was a little kid with my grandpa, it was always J-hooks. Um, we, uh, a lot of my, my anglers are uh, new. It's a, maybe their first time halibut fishing. And I know that uh, with the J-hook, it's kind of, it's foolproof. Even though I know that with a circle hook, you crank on it. We're, with, with the way I fish, we're fishing almost vertically. I feel like with the circle hook, I would want to, pull more from the side uh, of the fish or have the fish go away from me and then pull into it. I don't know, but that's, that's my answer. Uh, I've long, I was a commercial longliner for a while. Circle hooks work great, they're deadly. Sharp hooks, I think is the main thing. Catch and release, definitely. Um, I'm cutting my leaders. If I'm releasing fish, most of the time they've choked the bait. I don't go in there to get my hooks out. I know that those gamagatsus are gonna rust out because they rust from the time that I get them uh, on the boat to the time at the end of the day. I, I just, they're disposable for me. I don't mess around with them. Yes? Just a word of information. Yes? Ocean uh, puts on Dunn & Salem. Ocean, Oregon Coalition Educating Anglers. They really put a good one on about circle hooks and uh, 
how they did and everything. So, uh, good, good, great group. For information, 14 size and below you get small, how 16 and above you get the big ones. There you go. So a great tip right there, Ocean, a great group to go and check them out online. Uh, they do things like uh, provide descending devices to anglers. They re outreach between uh, ODFW and, um, you know, uh, anglers. Uh, again, a uh, great organization. It's it's up next February. I got a guy out standing up for a second. Uh, well, are all halibut right eye? I don't think so. There's a uh, California halibut, it may be left eye, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Keep sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, people beating the gills beach. Uh, so let me. So you want it? Where is the brain on the halibut and why? Or? Yeah. Well, I keep seeing people beat on the gills. Oh. Kind of yeah. Kind of yeah. 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 Uh, I always. That's what I do. You know, when I get a, a fish, especially to the side, I used to uh, pull out my nine millimeter and hold it down there and shoot them and it freak people out. And I didn't. It always made me feel uncomfortable because of. You know, it's dangerous. It's, I try and min minimize danger. The best thing to have, really, is is like what he's talking about. Smack them on the head, between the eyes, with a bat. Uh, a bat's not going to sink your boat. It's not going to freak people out, um, you know, that are next to you, you know. A bat works really good. I use my salmon gaff. I've broken a few of them on their heads. You know, you just take a wrap on that leader with some gloves on, and come swinging and, and hit them on the top of the head, right between the eyes, and usually that'll subdue them. It seems like a lot of people really don't know where that brain is on a halibut. I keep seeing them beat on the side of them when the brain isn't in the middle of that flat side. It's on the... Kind of on the ridge of the top, right? right? Yes. Yeah, it's a, yeah it's, they used to be a left and a right eye, and now they've got this ridge, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm swinging for the ridge and, and hard. And, and then one more. Is there a bank study that shows that our big fish go back to the yes. spot? Yes, they've done DNA and tracking studies. They, you know, anymore you can you can track your spouse or you can track a halibut. <laughs> you know, uh, and, then, and so uh, I do both. But <laughs> um, the, thing, the thing with with the with our with the halibut is for whatever reason where they're spotting that's. They, they want to be up in the Gulf of Alaska. They're not spawning out here successfully. So the fish that, that do travel up there are the ones that are continuing the, the line. And they know this uh, because of the pop-up satellite tags, DNA. Um, we don't have any juvenile halibut. We've never seen them uh, you know, on our coast. We have small halibut, but not juvenile, not the larvae. I think it has a lot to do with, with our north upwelling and the offshore currents. And, it just takes a lot, you know. Up there, they've got the, the big gulf, and everything swirls around in there, and keeps the eggs and the, the larvae, and they can settle out into that habitat. So, did your spouse complain when you tagged her? No, uh, she tagged me back. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not obviously able to have spot lock, um, so so just try. Right. So, if you're like the rest of us here, mortals who don't have any boat on our boat. <laughs> Um, if you're not, so if you're drifting like the rest of us are, yes. Do you see the spreader rig on that, or? Okay, so he's asking me if, if I'm drifting. Uh, do I still use a spreader rig? Uh, yes, I like the spreader rigs if I'm not fishing too many anglers. If I have to fish multiple anglers, then I might do more of a vertical rig, uh, where I'm just drop, uh, fishing like a drop shot. Uh, when, when I, the first job I had um, as a in the fishing guide business was over here on the Lady Jane out of Newport Sport Fishing. And we caught, me and Dell caught hundreds of halibut using a really simple drop shot rig. Uh, we tie it with like, I think it was probably 175 pound mono and a barrel swivel, big, big drop shot and a lead. And off of that drop shot we attached um, these wire leaders or we use a single hook uh, with the bait threader and somehow we attach it to that loop that works great. That's what we caught uh, our fish when I was a kid uh, with Grandpa and then in my teens uh, right up here off Stonewall. That was all I ever used. I got into spreader bar fishing uh, when I came into this anchoring. Uh, 
Um, you know, and that was it. Really kept my gear from tangling uh, on the drop and uh, spread out really well. Uh, so the spreader bars are, are killer for the anchor fishing. Yep. So you anchor up in 250, 500 foot of water? Yes. I so I, I've taken anchoring to the to the next level with the Minkota, but I also went even further because I wanted to fish on those days where it was windy. And so I went down and uh, bought a, a, a whole anchor setup, um, a Samson anchor line, uh, the, the, the chain, the anchor. I have a, a Norwegian style uh, anchor puller, which is you drive on this ball. Uh, and so yes, I, I can anchor up in 250 to 300 feet of water, and I and I have a thousand feet of anchor line, and it's all it was all rigged for my boat, it, and it's amazing. You can. You know, the, the problem is, is the, usually is you're the only one anchoring and everybody else is drifting. And so, uh, unless they know that you're, at, you know, that that's what you're doing, they'll drift into you and now you've got a lot of people mad at you. And then that back to that golden rule, I try not to do that around other people, but I do do it in the near shore. And most of the time when I anchor up and drop anchor, it's because I'm the only one that's out there anyways, uh, because of the conditions that I'm in. I, my Minn Kota wouldn't allow me to fish in that. There's no way I could back into it with it. But w when I'm on anchor in that wind chop, and I don't mean a big swell because, you, you know, I would never anchor in a large swell, and a large swell would be six, seven footers. What I'm thinking about is those days in, in um, July and August when we have a three, three, four foot swell, and what we have is wind chop. And so there's like a continuous three foot wind wave, and maybe it's blowing 15 knots. And um, if I just drop that anchor and I come on to hook, I'll sit. Just it's wonderful. I, I can shut everything off in the boat and just sit there and fish. And and the uh, the boat actually moves with the tide. I found uh, it's really interesting to see how the current angles change throughout the day. You may be over here uh, for an hour, and then you can watch on your chart plotter as the day went on, and now you're over here. Uh, so you get that that kind of bigger picture. Uh, you know, look at things and, and coming on to anchor is one of those things. They can set you up here at England Marine with all that stuff. The Samson line that you'd want to use, you have to be really careful about it. Uh, your choices of anchor line, you don't want stretchy line, but they can they can help you with that. That's what they, they, they set me up with all of mine, uh, all my gear. And then uh, there's some good videos on YouTube these days uh, that you can look into how they do it in Alaska. There's some Alaska, you know, how do they anchor Alaskan style. And you can do it all from the uh, stern of your boat as well. I don't, I don't get up on the bow and set an anchor. I don't pull it by hand. It's all done uh, from a line that attaches to my bow and goes to my stern. And um, I set the anchor from the stern and I back up the boat when it comes tight on the anchor that there's a, 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 a line that goes, you know, it just travels up that line that's attached to my bow and it all comes tight on a buoy ball. So if you see me out there and you see a big orange ball in front of my boat or anybody else's, that's probably what they're doing. They're probably sitting on anchor. What size sure. anchor do you use? So uh, I think the one that I have is, uh, it probably only weighs maybe 30 pounds. It's a, um, it, it's like a, I don't know what they, they call it, Josh would know, but it's, it looks like a scoop. Uh, yeah, like a plow type anchor. Uh, it all fits in, all this stuff fits in a garbage can. This is what I set it out of. Uh, I've got all my anchor line in the garbage can, I, the anchor sits on top. Um, one of the only reasons I did is because I, I, you know, I commercial fish for a while, and so I was comfortable with setting that. You know, there's a lot of things that you have to be really aware of, and, and Things are in motion and it, it can really go bad, you know, with an anchor and all that line and heavy boats. And so you do it with somebody who's, you know, uh, or, or make sure that you have a lot of forethought in it. Yeah. When you're putting the Minn Kota on the point like that and removing your anchor nest, do you carry an extra anchor? I know you do, but on average, do people carry an anchor with them in addition to the Minn Kota? And the I wonder, yeah. I, uh, you know, uh, I would always recommend having an anchor on board, um, at least at least with like 100 feet of line. Have an anchor in your boat just because if you lose power. Uh, but with the Minn Kota, it is a nice thing to have 
it, you know, it's, it's a, just one more layer of uh, options that you might have if you did have an emergency. I, I've actually used my Minn Kota when I, I forgot to tighten down a, f a fuel filter once and uh, my, I'm leaving the dock and I hear my engine blah 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 and, and my first thought was, oh, I just push the button and I come into anchor with my Minn Kota and then I dealt with it. It's really nice for that. It's hands free. You just now you're anchored. I didn't need to set an anchor, but I had one anyways. If I was drifting in the surf, that's when I'm going to be worried. Like I was pulling my crab pots and I ran into somebody's crab gear. All of a sudden, now my mains tangled up. Now that's the time when you when you're going right for the anchor. Set it. Boom. You're done. You're on. You're on hook, and it's going to stop you. You always want to use like at least a three to one. Uh, if you want to make sure that you're going to stop. Mm. Like a Danforth anchor? The Danforth, that would be a good one. Yep, they have them here. It looks like a scoop on one end. It's all the Bruce or Claw anchors that kind of... Yeah. Claw. Yeah, yeah Josh, Josh holds all that stuff. They've got it here at England. They can help you set it all up. It's a pretty big investment, but uh, yeah. when you actually go and use it, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, another level. It's just a game changer. You can... Now you're just you're stuck. You're sitting there and enjoying fishing instead of drifting and dealing with all the crap that goes along with that. Yeah, I use a chain road. It's at least the length of my vessel, so I use a 50-foot chain road. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing how the anchor works. It's all it's like snagging the bottom. The more angle you've got uh, towards that anchor, the more holding power it's got. Uh, so it doesn't take a heavy anchor to hold uh, a large vessel. Yes, sir. Your spot lock, how well can you hold with just the spot lock out there? Uh, so in, in, uh, it, it all comes down to the current and the wind uh, and, and how much is that. Um, every boat's going to be different. Uh, my North River, because it weighed about 6,000 pounds, it was able to hold um, in 10 knots of wind, let's say. You're going to find that out. When it starts white capping, it's not going to hold very well. It's going to struggle and you're going to come out of anchor and it's just, you're, you'll, you'll know. The, the trick though to, to get that extra hour out of your day is going to be with, with, when you're in spot lock and in anchor with your Minn Kota, take your kicker motor, oh. turn it on, and put it in gear. And it will, it will actually push against the boat enough that it helps that Minn Kota. And that, that is a huge battery saver. And it will, you can throttle up on your kicker and you'll find that sweet spot by watching your remote. You're looking at it and you're going, now my remote's not cycling all the way up to 10 power. It's, it likes, it's only cycling up to three or four or five. So then I know, okay, I've got my, I've got it set. Um, you know, and I know that I'm in a good, a good sweet spot with having the, the kicker pushing. Uh, it's a really, it's a, one of those guide tricks that you learn after being out there forever. Well, thank you, guys. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Surfacing on your electric reels. Do you oil it or just the level? So, it's crazy. Like I said, those, they got it right. Like, with those reels, I haven't hardly had any servicing done with them. I, I sent them back to Daiwa and had Daiwa go through them more as a formality because I was just like blown away that I wasn't doing anything to this and I was like man I gotta well, I gotta get these things and send them off and, and do my do, you know do my part with for my clients um, you know sometimes the bearings I'll hear them and then I know it's time to, to send them in that's kind of the, the, the thing and I've got a bunch of spares now that I just I kind of hold those spares back if I start hearing bearings or if I hear something weird going on with the electric motor, that's when I'm sending them away. But man, they're just, they're bulletproof. And uh, England's has got a great combo that they sell together where they pair that electric reel with your halibut rod. And those are some of the best rods uh, that, that I've gotten to use. Um, I, I like Lamy glass, I like expensive stuff. I like Shimano, Shimano, um, Rods are my favorite uh, for uh, bottom fishing. I've got the, uh, the Shimano's are just like bulletproof. Uh, but my, my salmon trolling rods are those same rods that they're using for in that combo. It's a, it's a glass blank. And anymore to buy a fiber, a glass blank rod, it's so expensive. It's like become this uh, 
du jour or some something really awesome, you know, that that uh, they're putting these high price tags on. But uh, a glass rod for trolling for salmon is where it's at. And England sells um, one that's like forty bucks. That's like I would have that over most five hundred dollar rods any day of the week, and I'll, I'll have two or three of them. You know, one sitting in the closet. <laughs> They got a little red tuna rod. Yeah, is it like that too? Yeah. Yeah. It's not bigger than that rod right back there on that wall. Yeah. The sharp one. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's, it's I see. Uh, you know, that's what it's all about when these uh, rod manufacturers build this stuff for us and then they give it to us guides to go out and test it. Uh, you know, you have to come see me in three or four years and I'll tell you how, how was your rod, you know. Um, it's hard to get me to switch away from Shimano. Um, I'm really liking Stryker and what they're doing. Uh, the, you know, it's built here in Oregon. Um, it, I really am attracted to their company and what they're doing as a, as a whole, but it's hard for me to give up those Shimano's right now because I've just, you know, I've fell in love with it. So I'm going to have to try out some of their stuff and see how long it lasts here. But, yeah. Why is it when these people post up online, uh, so I'm coming, to the coast, I don't say what for, coming to the coast in uh, July, August, whatever, and uh, what uh, what charter outfit should I book with, and you get half of the replies. I don't know why that happens. Uh, <laughs> I have to pay a lot of money to get people to do things. <laughs> I know that. Uh, I just, you know, we were one of the original uh, six packs that started up on the coast. Uh, I work really hard for my clients. Uh, I treat people like um, like I want to be treated. That golden rule. I just try and live my life like that. And I'm, you know, I just like this today. Uh, I could I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. I know that sounds crazy, but just like with, you know, I mean, we you all know that, and and uh, I know that, and I acknowledge it. And with my clients, I wouldn't have that uh, Raider boat uh, if it wasn't. For the clients that come with me, and uh, you know, I always tell them that I will keep that boat clean, <laughs> and I'll I'll take care of it. You guys just do your part and, and come see me and come fish with me. I take guys all the time fishing that have their own boats, really nice boats that they. I don't have any problem taking them out with me uh, to help get them through that learning curve. Uh, you know, uh, I just really enjoy what I'm doing. This is my music and I get to play it for you guys. So, thank you guys so much. I, I appreciate it. You can, I'll be here after, uh, you know, and I, we can talk or whatever. You can always message me online, Facebook. Um, I'm not hard to find. Sharky's Charters, uh, I'm down at Coos Bay. Okay, you guys, thank you.